Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure today to welcome Karen Gilliman to give the, um, to the NIH. Today she will pre pre ah, present the Rolla Eugene Dyer Lecture. This prestigious lecture was first given in 1951 by George Beadle. It honors Dr. Dyer, who in addition to being an NIH director, conducted research in the field of infectious diseases. A major focus of his work led to an understanding of how endemic typhi typhus is spread and the development of a vaccine to protect against the disease. Karen has a diverse scientific background that has positioned her to further our understanding of the interactions between microbes and their hosts in model organisms. As a graduate student at Stanford University in Mark Krasno's lab, she studied the development of the Drosophila respiratory system. Um, she later studied um, bacterial pathogenesis as a postdoctoral fellow in Stanley Falco's lab, also at Stanford. After that, she started her independent research career at the University of Oregon. As an independent researcher, she merged her interest in model organisms with her um, interest in microbes and started, began to study the microbiome of the zebrafish intestine. And there are many advantages to this approach. Um, this, you can study a large number of animals. You can visualize the inside of the intestine in live animals. You can control the genetic background of the animal, and you can control the microbes that the animal um, comes in contact with. Um, and these advantages have allowed Karen to address um, many important questions regarding the inter uh, interactions between microbes and their hosts that are very hard to um, address in um, humans or other vertebrates. Um, and this is particularly relevant, as many of you know, there was a common fund project called the, uh, the Human Microbiome Project. And this led us to realize that there are many cases where disease individuals have different microbiomes than non-diseased individuals. And of course, one of the obvious questions was, is the disease state causing the microbiome change or is the microbiome change causing the disease state? And I think model organisms like the system that Karen's going to tell us about today are a really good way to start addressing this. Um, and Karen has received many honors, including the American Society for Microbiology, Merck, Irvin S. Siegel Memorial Award and the NIDDK 60th Anniversary Early Career Investigator Award. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Karen to present her lecture entitled Molecular Dialogues with the Microbiota Biota, Insights from the Zebrafish Intestine. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for it. It's really an honor to be here today, um, and especially an honor to be giving this lecture uh, for microbiology. And, and I think it's especially exciting because we're in such an exciting time in the history of microbiology. So when we think back to the birth of microbiology as a field was really enabled by the um, discovery of uh, methods to amplify and visualize microbial cells with the innovation of microscopy. And, um, and I think one of the uh, things that was interesting about that moment when um, Antony Leeuwenhoek had discovered the existence of these animalcules that he, he found, that he was able to visualize with his microscopes, he, his immediate reaction was to ask, what are, the, what are these amicules that are associated with myself? So he looked at his saliva and his tears, and he asked, can we find um, microorganisms, these, these creatures of this microscopic scale um, associated with ourselves? And I, th I think now we're at this t moment in time with the advent of next generation sequencing that's giving us this whole new insight into microbes in our, in our world. And again, we're turning that attention onto ourselves and in efforts such as the NIH-funded uh, Human Microbiome Project, we're asking what are the uh, microbial associates that, that exist with us. And there's been this incredibly exciting flood of information about these communities that are associated with humans to the point where really the human, I think, is one of the most best described um, microbial ecosystem on our planet at this point. And it raises a lot of fundamental questions about these microbial communities. So we, we look within ourselves here, looking into a gastrointestinal tract at, at these, these microbes, and ask questions about um, how these communities assemble in um, association with hosts, and, and whether um, these communities change over time, and what other kinds of factors, environmental, diet, 
how host genetics might determine the composition of these communities that we coexist with. And ultimately, what do these, how do these communities affect the host biology? And um, what I'd like to um, put forth today is the importance of using model organisms to address some of these questions. And um, this is uh, just showing a few examples of some really powerful model organism systems that are used for studying host microbial interactions, including ones where you have just a simple association between a single symbiont and, a, and its host, or a simple consortia, or in the example of vertebrates like ourselves that have really complex microbial communities. And we'd like to understand something about the assembly and properties of these communities. And I'll be telling you today about the use of this model system of zebrafish to address some of these fundamental questions. And I'd like to further put forth the idea that really we need to be thinking about these, these questions of host microbe associations um, in the framework of systems biology, where we're thinking of systems of, of interacting microbial cells, and then building onto that framework, thinking about the systems of interactions between host and microbial cells, how these, these two interacting systems uh, work together, and ultimately thinking about populations of these host microbe superorganisms, how they, they interact, and then how they evolve uh, through time, how the, what are the types of selective pressures that, um, uh, that maintain these communities and allow them to change. And um, so I'm going to be telling you today about uh, three different kinds of systems level properties of host microbe systems. We'll be thinking how these systems assemble, what are their dynamics over time, and then um, at the end I'll be telling a little bit about some of our investigations on how these systems evolve in animal history. And the zebrafish model is a really useful one for doing this because we can modulate the complexity of these systems. Um, we have methods where we can derive germ-free or entirely sterile animals, and then we can use that as a platform to build up increasingly complex systems from mono-associated systems to, to the extent where we can just look at the recapitulation of, of a, an entirely complex community with a natural inoculum. And um, so then um, with this scalable complexity, we can really get, I think, some um, real insights into the system's properties of assembly. The um, fish is also, I think, a really uh, amazing model for looking at the dynamics of these systems because zebrafish larvae are transparent. And so here what you're looking at are individual bacterial cells within a zebrafish larva. This is an individual uh, zebrafish immune cell, a neutrophil, that's hanging out and looking at these, these microbes here. And, and we can really watch the dynamics of the um, behaviors of these individual bacterial cells. You can see these, these ones swimming here. We can look at interactions between the host cells and the microbial cells. And importantly, we can genetically manipulate both the host and the microbes so that we can do things like have them express fluorescent proteins to visualize them. And then uh, at the end of the talk, I'll be telling you a little bit about how we're using methodologies we've developed in zebrafish, these notobiotic methodologies, and transporting those to other fish systems where we can ask questions about evolution of these host microbe systems. So um, in particular, we've been focusing on the ecological and evolutionary model fish, the three-spined stickleback, which um, has diversified, and, um, and there's a lot of really uh, interesting data on on different populations of these fish, and we're starting to ask questions about how um, differences in the genetics of the host vary with differences in the microbiota. So I'm going to start today's talk talking about assembly of these host microbe systems. And this is work that is uh, funded through um, the uh, Institute of General Medicine. Uh, and it's a collaborative effort with my colleague, Brendan Bohannon, who's a microbial ecologist at University of Oregon and um, my co-conspirator in all things germ-free zebrafish, John Rawls, who's an investigator at UNC, and has involved a number of really talented graduate students. And in particular, I want to highlight Zach Stevens, who is a driving force bet uh, behind a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. And he's just both an exceptional experimentalist and also is becoming a really talented bioinformatician. And so um, when we started this project of starting to think about assembly of the zebrafish, uh, microbiota, how do these communities assemble in this model system? Um, we, we wanted to think about how um, these communities 
are both assembling a, a, the initial association of the host with its microbes, which occurs at hatching when the sterile embryo enters into a microbial world, and then um, sort of think about um, different events in the developmental history of these animals that might influence the microbial communities with which they're associated. And so we decided um, to do a, a longitudinal survey uh, across zebrafish development. So this is our little ZMP project where we're looking at the um, at, at populations of fish. We have replicate populations. And we decided to, to sample at different time points that bracketed different events. So for example, we sample at four days when the fish are first, um, the, the, the entire gastrointestinal tract is open and, uh, to the environment and is first being colonized. At 10 days after they've been feeding. And then we looked um, around the period where uh, the fish elaborate an adaptive immune response. So early in uh, the development of these fish, uh, they're of relying entirely on innate immunity to confer immune protection. Uh, but uh, at, at around f four weeks of age is when you first see a functional adaptive immune response. So we looked around these time points that bracket that. And then we also looked at a time point when, um, after which they've reached sexual maturity and are full adults. And we collected a lot of metadata in this analysis. So we sampled the water. We sampled all the sides in the bottom of the tanks. We sampled their food sources. The, um, their parents, and um, what, and we're just now um, analyzing all of this data. This was uh, data that was generated using Illumina sequencing, so we have uh, really a very rich data set. Um, but what I wanted to show, um, tell you one story that's emerging from this today is a story about how microbial communities are changing very dramatically over developmental time in this model system. And so I'm going to show you this using um, a representation of principal component analysis where every data sample is going to be placed somewhere on this plot of these two principal components that just represent the, the maximal space of variation of these different microbial communities. So this, this first um, point here represents the parents, the adult parents that gave rise to an, um, all of the progeny that were used for this study. And then um, up here you see the four day time points that are, are clustered at one position in space. And then as we go through time, we start to see that, that these communities are shifting in a rather uh, stereotyped manner. And so now um, here this, at 28 days, this uh, is a point where there's now a functional adaptive immune system. And if we look just a few days after that, we're starting to see, um, again, more of a shift. And then if we look at the adults, now we see that they're in a very different place clustering with those parents. So there's this very dramatic change in the community structure which is also represented by uh, when we look at the different phyla that were present in these fish at these different time points. And what was really striking to us is that we knew quite a bit about these larval stages. We knew that they were dominated by gamma protea bacteria. We also knew um, quite a bit about the adult zebrafish. But what we were struck by is how dynamic and different these changes are through their, their life uh, history. And so we really didn't know that there was this bloom of these other bacterial groups that one sees at these different developmental time points. And that's something that's exciting for us to think about is how um, associations with your microbes are really changing with your developmental history. So the, um, this was looking at the natural complexity of, of the, um, the fish. And, and, and one question that we had was, is that um, uh, the, the difference between individuals, does that um, uh, diverge over time? And one hypothesis we had was that with acquisition of adaptive immunity, where now your previous history of exposures to microbes are influencing your immunological state, would that increase your individuality of your microbiota? And, and then we do have some evidence to suggest that. So this is looking at how different the individual samples are from each other um, by, by one metric. So you, um, one way to describe this uh, uh, would be uh, the, the beta diversity of these samples. And so these, if we look at the uh, adult fish at 75 days, they're uh, much more different from each other than these uh, uh, fish at, at four days. So that would suggest that, that there is something about uh, this, um, that as individuals per go on their life trajectory, they're assembling uh, more individual communities. Um, and we also, in, in this study, were able to sample aspects of uh, the 
um, immunology of the, these individuals. So uh, one measure uh, is we looked at the amount of secreted immunoglobulin transcripts from each individual in the study. And um, I'm just showing you that data for these different time points. And um, these are color coded for the different tanks of the fish. What was very striking to us is how much variation one sees um, between individuals uh, in the level for, of, of uh, expressed secreted immunoglobulin transcript. And there were some trends where certain tanks, like this, this tank, this um, green tank here, looked like levels in general were much lower than some of the other tanks. But we also see, as one sees in this tank, some, uh, a great amount of inter individual variation within a tank. So we're just now looking at how these kinds of measurements of diversity in the immune uh, responsiveness of the host might uh, correlate with diversity in the associated microbes. And I think this, these kinds of data are really going to tell us a lot about some of the immunological influences on community membership. So we're also interested in looking at assembly in very simple systems. And so now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we've been doing, looking at just um, early events of uh, fish colonization using very simple um, systems where we're mono-associating fish. And one thing um, that we wanted to do was just establish the rate of colonization. If we inoculate larval germ-free fish with a single inoculum of a dominant member of the microbiota and aeromonas strain that we work with, um, we were able to see a very characteristic trend where um, you, at uh, 24 hours after colonization, you have a maximal capacity of um, about 10 to the fourth colony forming units of this bacterium per gut. And, um, and you'll note that at, at six and a half uh, hours post inoculation, you're not at that full capacity. So um, there still uh, is, is room to colonize. And then um, uh, my student Jennifer Hampton did an interesting experiment where she just did a timed series of inoculations with two identical strains of this aeromonas um, that were differentially marked. And um, what, what she found when she performed this experiment um, she, uh, the experiment was to inoculate fish, then wait for six hours, introduce another differentially marked strain, and then wait and, and look at 24 hours later, um, and look at the success of the second strain in colonizing. And what she found, which was uh, quite remarkable to us, and it happened both at this five-day period or the seven-day period, is that the second strain was largely excluded after the six-hour time period, even though these are identical strains. Um, but just differentially marked. And it, this is a, the six hour time point we had established was not, the, the, the uh, gut is not at this full carrying capacity. And so we wanted to look at that further and, and look at re really the dynamics of colonization. And um, so now I'm gonna uh, introduce you to uh, my colleague uh, Raghu Parthasarathi, who has co been collaborating with us on a new approach to imaging uh, doing live imaging in zebrafish. And this uses uh, technology called light sheet microscopy, which um, is, is a pretty simple strategy, but uh, is something that requires a custom microscope to perform. Um, and and uh, what it does is it, it uh, involves illuminating a sample, a specimen with a sheet of light and then imaging perpendicular to that light. And um, this has a lot of advantages, including that it causes very little photo damage, so we can image for long periods of time um, our, our tissues. And, and this has uh, also been a great collaboration with two physics graduate students, um, Mike Termino and um, Matt Jeremita. And um, so the first experiment that we did was to just look if we inoculated uh, germ-free zebrafish with differentially marked populations, now we're marking them with different fluorophores, and just imaged over 24 hours, and we wanted to look at that, what that colonization looks like. And we see that we um, end up with intestines that are robustly colonized by both the um, red and green cells at equal proportions. And we actually then can look at the distributions of these populations of microbial cells uh, along the length of the gut. And, and we're, we're, um, you know, each of these imaging experiments involves uh, 300 gigabytes of information. So this is a vast amount of information that, that we're generating. And so we're also thinking about ways to process it. But this is one way where we just use the axis of the gut as one axis and we collapse down 
the fluorescence intensity information along that axis and then look across time. And you can start to get these impressions of how there's quite a lot of dynamics of this colonization and how non-uniform it is that um, we see these sort of, um, different distributions of microbial cells. So then we, we uh, performed some experiments where we did these serial inoculations. So this is an experiment where we inoculate first with one strain and then a second strain three hours later. And what we found here was um, that we did see um, some of the, the green cells, but, but there was actually a more predominance of the red cells at this, this time point. And then if we replicated the, the experiment of uh, waiting for six hours before we added the second inoculum, then we saw again, as we had observed in our planning data, that um, we really, so mostly um, there's, there's gr the green cells are present and not the red. And, and we've done these also reversing the two colors which, which we add first. So we're, we're finding that there's this really interesting um, uh, exclusion of, of uh, subsequent members colonizing. This, is, this looks like there's some real strong priority effects as to, to who um, colonizes first even when you're, you're talking about two identical strains. And that, for us, raises the possibility that um, maybe there are ways in which the actual colonization event of the host is changing this environment, making it a more restrictive environment for sub subsequent uh, colonization. And one of the things that we're excited to do is to start to look at, in real time during colonization, at the innate immune responses to the colonization event. So this is um, some images that we've taken from a transgenic zebrafish line that has a reporter for the innate immune uh, uh, um, pathway, the NF-kappa B signaling pathway, and this is, was developed by our colleague John Rawls. And we're able to see at a cellular resolution which cells are activating this innate immune signaling. And, and we can, if we look carefully over time, we can actually follow certain changes of, of intensity of, of this, the signaling in certain cells. And so we're excited to see whether there's a correlation of increased uh, activity of the innate immune signaling and this, this, in this period where there's restriction to colonization dynamics. And then we're also interested in activities of different immune cells. This is a transgenic zebrafish line that where um, you can visualize the neutrophils along the intestine. So this is the, the intestine. And the, the neutrophils are expressing green fluorescent protein. And so you can see, even though this is a, a, a little bit fuzzy, but you can see these very active neutrophils exploring this intestinal environment. And we imagine that these neutrophils, um, you know, they're creeping along and extending processes are doing so in response to the microbial constituents. And, and we're interested to look at those interactions between um, the host immune cells and the resident microbial cells. So um, we're also interested in thinking about dynamics, not just of, of the simple systems of colonization, but when we think about more complex um, assembled communities, how are those communities interacting with the host, and, um, and how does that balance between the host and the microbial community get established? And here I want to just tell you um, two very uh, short vignettes of some insights that we've gained from looking, comparing the colonized state of the zebrafish with, with germ-free animals and learning something about the dialogues that go on between the microbial and the uh, host cells. And so the first one, this is one of our, the first findings that we made when we started looking carefully at the uh, our uh, germ-free zebrafish and asking uh, whether there were any kinds of uh, uh, developmental differences or maturation differences in the intestine. And what we found is that in germ-free animals compared to conventionally reared animals, there was a paucity of this brush border enzyme alkaline phosphatase that we could visualize with uh, this, this staining here shown in blue. And we could restore alkaline phosphatase back if we added back an uh, inoculum just from the, the conventional uh, controls. And, and that's what we call these ex-germ-free animals. And we could quantify that enzymatic activity very nicely. And so here you can see, again, the germ-free animals have less of that enzymatic activity than conventional animals. And then we could start to ask what kinds of signals uh, from the microbes are inducing this activity. So first we showed that we could restore activity with a complex microbial community, or if we just use a single mono association with a gram-negative 
bacterium, but not with a gram-positive bacterium. And so then we tested a major component of the bacterial um, cell wall of gram-negative cells, lipopolysaccharide, and found that that was sufficient to induce activity in these germ-free animals, and even to increase activity when added back to conventional animals. And so um, we went on to study something about the regulation of alkaline phosphatase activity by LPS, but we were also really um, puzzled to think about why this uh, uh, bacterial cell wall component might be increasing alkaline phosphatase in the intestine during colonization. And um, one uh, thing that was very interesting to find uh, in the literature is that LPS can actually be a substrate for alkaline phosphatases, and th uh, these enzymes will remove the phosphates on the lipid A moiety of uh, LPS, and this is the endotoxic portion of this molecule that actually is, is what causes endotoxic shock if you expose an animal to large quantities of LPS. And so we wondered whether alkaline phosphatase in the intestine might be functioning to detoxify levels of LPS that are present um, because of the microbiota. And so we were able to establish that um, LPS is, uh, has endotoxic activity in zebrafish. If we add it to the, the water, we can um, see a, a, a specific killing curve. And furthermore, if we made uh, zebrafish that were modified so that they lacked intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity, now they were really hypersensitive to LPS killing, as were the germ-free fish, which I showed you also have reduced alkaline phosphatase activity. So that told us that alkaline phosphatase has an important role in protecting against exogenously added LPS. But we were um, curious whether this enzyme might actually have a function in modulating responses to the uh, LPS associated with the microbiota. And for that, we needed to look at a more subtle phenotype, and we looked at um, the recruitment of neutrophils into the intestine as a marker for intestinal inflammation. And what we found, um, we, could see, we could visualize these cells with a histological stain for myeloid peroxidase activity. So these are these little brown cells that are within the intestine. And we found that in conventionally reared animals, there was a low number of these cells. In contrast, in germ-free animals, there was a complete absence of those cells. So that told us that actually the state, the uh, you know, normal homeostatic level of neutrophils in a conventionally reared animal is set by the presence of the microbiota. We could increase the number of neutrophils that are present in a fish if we expose them to lipopolysaccharide. And we also observed that in fish that were genetically engineered to um, have reduced intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity, they also had an increase of these, these cells. So it, it's sort of the moral equivalent of lacking this enzyme was uh, having too much LPS. So that would, that would be the hypothesis. And if that's really the case, then we should alleviate this inflammation if we remove the microbiota, which we're hypothesizing as a source of LPS in the situation. And so that's what we, were, we found. So these are now looking in cross sections of zebrafish intestines. And in a conventionally reared uh, animal lacking intestinal alkaline phosphatase, as I showed you, there's an influx of neutrophils. But those are absent in the germ-free animals. And that's just quantified on, on this slide here. So this was telling us that. Um, there's this dialogue going on between uh, the microbiota that, through uh, the presence of, of LPS, um, are inducing this enzyme in the host, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which then acts to detoxify LPS associated with the microbiota. And then that would promote an appropriate um, inflammatory reaction to this community. And so we saw this as a, uh, an important balance uh, in, the, in the dynamics of the, the host microbial interaction. And when um, completing this work, we started to think about other ways in which you could maybe have an imbalance set up um, in this dialogue. And one thing that we wondered is whether there might be situations where you have altered gut physiology that could give rise to an altered microbiota that might be functionally different and increase inflammation uh, in, in the intestine. And so this would be another different kind of dynamic, a more pathological dynamic um, that could maybe drive intestinal inflammation. And so um, the work I'm going to tell you now is a collaboration with my colleague Judith Eisen um, and a, a number of uh, talented investigators. And I par uh, partnered with Judith because she had, was very interested in the nervous system that innervates the gut and controls uh, gut motility. 
And she had been studying a mutant in a transcription factor SOX10, uh, which is absolutely required for the spe specification of enteric neurons, the neurons that innervate the gut. And um, so this has profound functional consequences. So here I'm showing you um, a video of, of gut motility in a wild-type animal, and this uh, is showing the enteric neurons of that animal. If we look in these SOX10 animals, they lack enteric neurons, and they also lack those strong peristaltic waves that you just saw. So they, there's a little bit of, of movement, but um, they're, they're not able to uh, push uh, contents through the gut, and you can see that also in this functional assay where we can feed our fish in a sort of pulse chase experiment a, a, a green fluid and then a, give a pulse of red food and then visualize them after uh, at that time point. And wild type fish are efficient at clearing out that food through their gut. And so in this uh, wild type animal, you just see the red food at the end of that treatment. Whereas in the the SOX10 mutant fish, you can see there's this bolus of, of uh, green food that's still maintained in these animals. And so we wondered uh, whether this, this kind of change in the um, ecology of the intestine might actually have uh, functional consequences. And we found that indeed these SOX10 mutant animals, when we quantified the number of neutrophils in their intestines, had significantly higher level of inflammation by this, this metric than their wild-type siblings. And importantly, these are experiments where we're rearing the SOX10 mutant and wild-type animals in the same dish, so the same microbial inoculum, and yet they, they have elaborate different kinds of uh, inflammatory responses. And um, we could show that this was an inflammatory response to the microbiota by showing that when we derived our SOX10 mutants under germ-free conditions, we saw uh, just low levels of inflammation indistinguishable from wild type. And so we wondered whether um, th this inflammation that we're seeing in our mutants was really due to an altered, a functionally different microbiota. And the way we can test that in our zebrafish model is to do a microbiota transplantation experiment, where we take uh, the gut contents of an inflamed donor and then we um, inoculate that into a dish with germ-free wild-type recipients, and then we could distinguish whether that uh, inflammation associated with this mutant microbiota is transmissible to germ-free wild-type animals. And what we found is that, indeed, when um, we used a microbiota donor from these SOX10 mutant animals, uh, we did see increased inflammation as compared to the um, the wild-type siblings from that same dish. And also importantly, in, um, if we transplanted microbiota from our intestinal alkaline deficient fish, we didn't see uh, uh, increased inflammation. And we would think that in this case, uh, the inflammation is due more to the, the presence of LPS, but not, um, uh, not to a shift in the microbiota. So this was telling us that, that um, under certain situations, you can have a microbiota uh, that is, is pro-inflammatory. And um, so we, we think that in this situation where we have this amodal gut, that's setting up a situation where we have this altered microbiota that's uh, driving intestinal inflammation. And um, we think that's, that's you know, another example of how the dynamics between the host and the microbiota uh, are, are playing out, in this case, driving a, a, a disease state. And, um, as we thought more about these kinds of questions, it became uh, you know, fascinating to us to think more generally about this paradigm of how host genotype or traits may influence microbiota composition and then um, play back on the host phenotype. And again, you, where you could get sort of a, a, you know, this, this continual dialogue between the, these two interacting systems. And one way that we um, would like to look at that is look at how these different associations evolve over time. What are the host genes that are changing in evolutionary time that may influence these different types of associations? And so this is work with my colleague, uh, Bill Cresco at the University of Oregon, who uh, has really been a pioneer in developing the fish system of uh, the three spine, spine stickleback as a great um, system for asking evolutionary questions. And this was, uh, a great team of people who went out. This is where we actually were, were catching stickleback from a, a, a stream just in Eugene um, to so, sample their microbiota. 
Uh, and so Stickleback have, has have really um, turned out to be a great model system for asking questions about um, evolution. And it's quite relevant um, when thinking about, uh, thinking of Stickleback as, as a model for, for questions about human evolution, um, because they actually have quite similar population structures where um, there's been, uh, in the case of the fish, uh, um, the ancestral population from the oceans then was isolated during um, the recession of the glaciers into various different freshwater populations, and then there's been evolutionary uh, uh, you know, uh, events occurring during that time period that have really differentiated these different populations. And so um, Bill's lab has, has uh, been instrumental in developing techniques to use those differences between ocean and freshwater fish to just to map, do F2 mapping um, using uh, technology developed by my colleague Eric Johnson at University of Oregon RAG uh, sequencing to uh, identify uh, loci in the genome that correlate with different traits. And so, for example, they've been able to uh, map traits associated with the presence or loss of body armor in, in the, the fish. And so our idea was that um, we could look at uh, associated microbial communities in these populations and, um, and, and look uh, whether we could find associated genes that um, uh, segregate with these differences in populations. And um, so our initial surveys of ocean and freshwater derived populations, we have found differences in these microbial communities. So this is just this one example. Um, we're now uh, um, moving forward on an experiment where we uh, have what we're calling a common garden experiment where we inoculate uh, our, and maintain both populations of the ocean and freshwater populations in the same tank. So they're sharing the same microbial environment. And we're looking at what kinds of communities assemble under these shared conditions. But we've also made some advances in transporting our uh, zebrafish notobiology techniques to the stickleback. So this is just showing you that we can um, th this is a stickleback gastrointestinal tract, and then these are cross sections showing you that um, we can visualize bacteria in a conventionally reared stickleback, and we can derive germ free stickleback. And we can also look at the neutrophil influx in these uh, different uh, stickleback. And so, what we find um, in, in one strain of fish that we've looked at, that there are abundant uh, neutrophils in the conventional state and many fewer in the germ free state. But what was very interesting is when we looked, the, so those data were derived from the ancestral ocean populations where you can see this very distinct difference between um, the germ-free and conventionally reared fish um, and the number of neutrophils. But um, what we found is that in the freshwater populations, there was very little difference between the germ-free and the conventional state. And it was um, overall a much more muted inflammatory response. And so we're really fascinated to think about how variation in the strength of the uh, uh, innate immune response to the resident microbiota might actually play out in ways in, that, that could shape the community assembly of, of these um, communities. And um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at these, uh, the community structure of, of these different fish that were reared in the same inoculum. We're um, just now analyzing our data from um, 16S profiling, but we also have data from uh, uh, culture-based analyses, and um, that's what I'm showing you here with uh, 10 freshwater individuals on top and uh, 10 of the marine individuals on the bottom. And um, what, uh, at first glance, uh, what strikes us is that it looks like the freshwater individuals have a more random assemblage of community members in comparison to the marine. And we wonder if um, this could be correlated with uh, the uh, more muted immune response that we're seeing in these animals to their microbiota. So uh, we're excited to uh, continue to explore these kinds of questions. And um, so we, what our work is really showing is that there uh, are some interesting ways in which crosstalk between the host and in particular the host immune system and uh, the microbiota can really um, have profound influences on the composition of this microbial cell system as well as the super system of the, the host um, colonized by its microbiota. So some examples of that that I've uh, touched on today are um, 
the, looking at our profiles of microbiotic community assembly over time in our, the zebrafish, and we see that there's um, this very dramatic change in, in the community structures over developmental time. Um, and then we also see that there's this correlation with the acquisition of adaptive immunity and um, more um, individuality to the microbiota. So uh, this is something that we're eager to continue to explore. We can look, for example, in immunocompromised fish that lack an adaptive immune system and, and ask if we fail to see that kind of individuality elaborated uh, in those kind of life trajectories. We are also um, intrigued by the kinds of priority effects that we've uh, started to uncover when we've done these very simple assembly experiments, um, just uh, uh, colonizing germ-free fish with just uh, a single strains of bacteria, and um, wondering whether um, immediate innate immune responses to the microbiota might be part of what creates these sorts of priority effects we're detecting. So that's another um, area where the, the dialogue between the, the microbiota and the hosts might have very uh, immediate consequences, but then could have long-lasting uh, historical consequences um, in what types of communities assemble. And then um, I've told you the story about how um, our investigations into the regulation and function of intestinal alkaline phosphatase has told us, given us an example of how signaling and molecular dialogues between the microbiome and the host can tune the immune responsiveness of the host. So um, we imagine and um, are exploring the possibility that the level of intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity is really um, important for maintaining an appropriate inflammatory response to associated microbiota. So if you um, have an, uh, an adequacy in that activity, as we showed that you have an excessive inflammatory response to your microbiota, perhaps having too much of this enzymatic activity would make you, um, make the host really uh, deaf to the presence of, of uh, important signals, potentially from pathogens that, that are there to, to prime the innate immune system. So there might be a, an appropriate level of, of uh, tuning that needs to happen, and that is uh, established through a dialogue with the microbiota. And then we also have, I told you about the example of these SOX10 amodal uh, intestines where we see the elaboration of a perturbed microbiota that um, is, is functionally capable of, of driving excessive inflammation even when transplanted into a wild type recipient. And so um, we think that that's uh, going to be a really exciting model to explore the kinds of uh, situations that can drive intestinal inflammation uh, in disease states. And then finally, I um, have introduced you to this new model that we're exploring of the three-spine stickleback, which we think is going to be a powerful way for um, identifying how uh, differences in microbiota across individuals and across populations, um, uh, what types of, of uh, uh, genetic loci are associated with those, but also exploring the possibility that functional differences between um, individuals such as their immune responsiveness to their microbiota might contribute to aspects of the um, microbiota composition. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, many really important collaborators, um, Raghu Sarathi, who we've been collaborating with on this light sheet microscopy and imaging, Judith Eisen, who I work with on um, thinking about the enteric nervous system. Uh, Bill Cresco, who has uh, been uh, introducing us to this, this stickleback system uh, for asking evolutionary questions. Uh, Brendan Bohannon and Jessica Green are both uh, really great colleagues at University of Oregon thinking about microbial ecology. And uh, John Rawls, uh, who along with, with Brendan is, is a PI on my uh, funding from uh, NIGMS. And then the work I told you about today about intestinal alkaline phosphatase um, that we are pursuing is funded through NIDDK. And then these are a lot of really great members of my lab, and in particular, um, I want to highlight Zach Stevens, who is actually involved in all of the projects I talked about today. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks. So if you have a question, come to the microphone. Um, I guess I have one question to start with about the experiments where you were mixing the two genetically identical bacteria with different timing. Have you tried 
If you take LPS and add it when you added the first species and then add the second species, do you see the same effect? And in the experiment where you had the can resistant and the riff resistant, if you add rifampicin and the riff resistant at the same time, do you still see the same effect? Uh, well, those are both good questions, and we haven't, uh, those, are, those are good suggestions. We haven't done either of those, but that, those would be, uh, I think those, those would be interesting ideas to test. So looking first at whether pre, sort of priming the innate immune response previously would, would create it's this block, is, block it, and then also kind of compromising the ability of the first one to colonize by adding in an antibiotic. Is that the idea right, of the yeah. second experiment? Yeah, getting yeah. rid of the bacteria to see if they've done something or whether it's the presence of Yes, them. yeah, yeah, and those are both feasible experiments, yeah. I think I have a similar question about the, it's the sort of the priority effect, and you showed with similar strains, the first strain that gets a foothold has, uh, maintains that foothold, and you showed that in your SOX10 mutant, something happens to make these microbiota more inflammatory. Have you considered taking those microbiota, doing the same pulse chase, and seeing if now they can outcompete the original population? Yeah, that's another great idea. So our, our initial priority effect experiments have just been very simple with, you know, a single strain. We've, we've played around with, uh, with binary strains, but it'd be really interesting to see what we could select out of that, that, um, that, that different community. That, and that actually might be an interesting enrichment for uh, certain members. So, so we're, we're looking at using, you know, um, culture independent methods to profile the, the SOX10 uh, communities of, in these dysbiotic uh, situations, but we're also really interested in actually enriching and culturing different members that we could work with. So that might be an, a, a neat way to do that. Okay. So another question on the priority effect. Do you actually need a zebrafish gut to see this? Does this happen in a broth culture it, or, or on a petri plate? Yeah, that's a great question, and it doesn't happen. So we can we can recreate it in a test tube, and we don't get that same effect. <laughs> really glad to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> Michael. So yet yeah, this is another priority question, I guess. Which I guess you're going to get a lot of these. Um, so bacteria, the same genetically identical bacteria, of course, can grow in very different ways depending upon its environment. And I'm wondering if you've looked similar to see whether simply the, by being introduced into the gut, it, it changes the mode of growth of the, or changes the bacteria um, uh, non-genetically, physiologically in such a way that they're more likely or less likely to recolonize. Yes, I, I, that, that's also an excellent question that we've, we've, so we haven't addressed it, but it's, it's a hypothesis that we've, we've thought about. And um, there's certainly a lot of examples of pathogens for which that, that model has been validated. So I think it's a good one to think about. I have a non-priority question. Okay. So uh, diet uh, uh, often dictates uh, the type of bacteria you have in your gut. So have you looked into whether you can tease apart the type of diet is it a common fish food for the ocean-going fish versus fresh water uh, that you're giving them? Can you switch around diets and see if you can switch around the microbiota composition? Yes, we're very interested in this question of diet, and that's actually a focus of my colleague John Rawls's work. Um, one of the, the, the nice things about um, these experimental systems is that we can manipulate these things. So for the um, experiments with uh, where we're, we're looking at community in the uh, stickleback populations, they're all receiving the same diet, they're in the same environment, so we can control for all of those things. But their natural diets would be quite different, and that's actually, you know, one of the driving forces of why they've evolved these different um, uh, external morphologies is that they have different kinds of uh, predator strategies. Um, and, but also, the, the question of diet is relevant for the study that we did just on the, the longitudinal study of the zebrafish. They're actually receiving different diets uh, at different times. So we, our first uh, pass was just to profile them as they are normally reared in our facility, which means that they're reared on a diet initially of paramecia, and then as they get big enough, then they're given a diet of brine shrimp, and then you know, uh, that's further supplemented as adults. Um, and, and so, so that's, that's a parameter that then, now that we, you know, have that baseline, we can compare as we manipulate diets. You can ask one more question. Just out of curiosity, when you grow the salt water and the fresh water together, do you grow them in salt water or fresh water or? Brackish <laughs> water, so in, in intermediate, and, and so that's, you know, 
that, that's one of the advantages of that system that you can grow them in the same environment. Okay, um, I'm sure Karen would, if you have individual questions, Karen will be happy to entertain them, but I'll give you one more thanks and thanks for all coming.